welcome to the well at Renew. You know, the well is uh, something that I've thought about for an awful long time. And if you're not real familiar with Renew, we haven't been around very long, but uh, God has done amazing things here in a short amount of time. But the well idea was something I've thought about for a long, long while. It comes out of John chapter 4, and it's a story about this woman who comes to the well for water. And it's an ordinary day for her, but she goes at a strange time of the day to go and fetch water. She's probably not the most popular person in town. And she goes to collect water, and she meets Jesus there, and he offers her living water. And I think that's one of the most beautiful stories. It's a beautiful picture of a coffee shop, church type idea where people can come for one thing, but what they end up finding is something totally different. But what they find, although they may come for coffee or come for uh, good snacks or come because of good friends or whatever, what they find is life and something that's different. So that's what this well is all about. That's what our Monday night service is, uh, was always intended to be, is that kind of idea. So I'm thankful you're here. If I didn't get a chance to meet everybody, I think I did. I'm Spencer. I'm, I'm pastor here at Renew. And so these Monday nights are very different than what we do on Sunday. Sunday we have a, a rocking band, and I love that. And on Mondays we have a low-key uh, acoustic worship, and I love that too. A different way to be able to come into the presence of God. Because he promises that he's here. And so what we're going to do tonight is we're just going to sing a few songs. I'm going to give you an opportunity to, uh, to share in communion, and I'll talk about that here in a, in a minute or two. And so give, if that's something you're being prompted to do, to offer gifts of uh, your money even, which is part of worship, because everything that we do is, is uh, when we do it with the right part, is worship, whether that's in singing, which we can sing without being worship, right? Because worship is saying that God is worthy. We can sing songs all day long that is not worship. I'm guessing everyone in here knows how to do that. You know, we can sing songs that are not exactly worship. And it doesn't matter what the words are. We can read these words and just have them be words. And it's not worship. If it's not us saying, God is worthy. And so our singing is saying, oh, God is worthy. That's worship. And I hope that's with you. I hope it's something you want to participate in, even if you don't know the tune. Focus on those words because it's part of worship. To pray is worship. You being here and saying, God is worthy of my time, that's worship too. And as we look at the word a little later, and I'm going to give you an opportunity to ask me questions. We always, on Monday nights, one of the things we do different is we have an opportunity for Q&A. You can ask me questions about faith or science, because I used to be a science guy, and uh, or what, whatever you want. We can talk through that. And, uh, and then tonight, at the very end, we have a baptism, which is exciting. And we're going to have that as an opportunity. And if anyone else has ever thought about that and never done that, you could do that tonight, too. We actually have clothes and everything. And so uh, and I'll explain that a little bit later. So I want to pray and then just get started. We're going to start with this Lord Reign in Me song, which is an important prayer to ask God to be not just Savior, but also Lord, to run my life. It's an important prayer. So let's pray. God, thanks for giving us a time to just come and to be in your presence, to be in your presence with other people who are seeking, who are curious, who believe, who love you and follow. We have people in every different place, even in the small crowd. And God, help each one, no matter where they are, to know that they're safe here, but also to know that where we stay, where we are, is not a place to stay, but a place to continue to grow from, to grow closer to you. So we invite your presence here tonight. We invite you and ask you to move in us. I pray, God, that you will cast away any darkness or anything that lurks in us and around us that causes us confusion or distraction. And instead, let us feel your presence here tonight. Change us to be different when we leave here than we were when we came. In Jesus' name, amen. Sunset sky, but my 
Over all my dreams, in my darkest hour, you are the Lord of all I have. So won't you reign in me again? Over every thought, over every word, may my life reflect the beauty of my Lord. More to me than any earthly thing. So won't you reign in me again? Lord, reign in me, reign in your power over all my dreams. In my darkest hour, you are the Lord of all my hell. So won't you reign in me again? Lord, reign in me, reign in your power over all my dreams. My darkest hour, you are the Lord of all I am. So won't you reign in me
God, we thank you for giving us music to be able to touch our very souls, to sing these songs that mean so much. We're so rich in praise for you. So God, continue to move in us. In Jesus' name. One of the things that we love to do here is um, sing. One of the other things we love to do here is pray. We do that a lot. One of the things we love to do here is look and see what God has to say, not just what Spencer thinks. That's important. Although God has called me to help share that with you, but you can't just rely on what I say to be what guides you, to be able to focus on looking at what God has to say in your life on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and each day is important. And part of what we love to do is remember the one very important thing that draws us here, and that is that Christ died for you. Without that, we are totally and completely wasting our time. Because without that, there is no hope. It is only because God, in his infinite wisdom and his infinite love for you, made a way for you to be with him. Because our sin and the things that we do that are apart from God keeps us from God. When we leave this earth and we go and stand in front of God, we can't be in God's presence if we're full of sin. And so there has to be a way to be able to be cleansed, to be able to be made pure again, so that one day we can stand in front of God. And so none of us are perfect. Every single one of us in the room fail, including myself. We fail, we make mistakes. But God took on flesh, that's Jesus. He walked and he taught and he went to the cross and he died for you and for me so that you can be saved. To pay the penalty. And tonight we're going to actually talk about that a little bit for a few minutes. We're going to talk about an important word that's in this song, which is reconcile. What does that word mean? This last song we sang, Sweetly Broken. And I was under your wrath and now through the cross and reconciled. That's important. But we're going to get there in a few minutes. But one of the things we love to do is remember the body and the blood of Jesus. Because it was important enough for him to take those that were closest to him on the night that he was betrayed and took them aside and said, this is my body. This is my blood. The bread representing the body and the juice or the fruit of the vine or the wine that they shared was represented the blood. He took bread and broke it and said, take it, eat this, and remember it my body that's broken for you. Take and drink. Remember, my blood will be shed and shed for you. And as you often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And I'm convinced, as I read through the Bible, those early Christians, they did this all the time. They would come together and they would study the apostles' doctrine and they would pray and they would fellowship and they would share in this communion and they would eat this meal together to remember the body and the blood of Jesus. And I think Monday nights are is way closer to what I can envision of sitting at tables and sitting together, although they probably lounged on the floor on pillows and stuff. We could do that sometimes too, that'd be fun. But you'd have to take your shoes off. You might not enjoy that part. <laughs> Only for young people. Yeah, yeah, for the young people. We get down and do that, but to share that. So we want to give you an opportunity if you want to share in that community, you want to share in that remembrance, because that's what it is. It's a way to remember the body and blood of Jesus. And sometime during the next couple songs, we invite you to do that. And we've just got a simple tray up here of juice and a bread to break that off and remember, to drink and remember, and uh, to share in that moment of communion with Christ, communion with each other. And so uh, we're going to sing some more, and uh, we just invite you to do that if you'd like. Let me pray. God, thanks for, um, again, for forgiving us of our sins. Thank you for reconciling us, for redeeming us, paying the price to set the captives free. We are captive to sin, captive to the things that mess us up when we don't know you. But God, you pay that price and pay that penalty. And the hope always for me, Lord, is that each one that hears these words that sees you in this moment will call on your name. Will seek you for forgiveness.
scarlet to make us white as snow. And so, Father, we pray that each person will hear and understand and choose to follow. But it's because you are our king that we choose to follow. So move in us in this time in Jesus' name.
we'll see this. This is talking about the temporal and eternal. And Paul says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. I'm going to stop there and just say, I love that. Brand new. Reborn. This idea of being renewed. That's why sometimes we write that word renew funny regarding something new. R-E colon new. It's about renew like Romans 12 too. Don't be conformed to the world. In other words, don't let the world shove you in its box. But be transformed. The Greek word is metamorphia. Metamorphosis. Change from the inside out by the renewing of your mind. To change the way we think changes us from the inside out. We're new. We're renewed. So Paul says, if anyone is in Christ, he's new, brand new. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Who doesn't want a new start? I don't know about you, but when I was about 21, and I finally came to figure out who Jesus was, I could not wait for a new start. To say, all the old has passed away. Now, that doesn't mean all of the consequences of bad decisions go away, but in God's eyes, every foul thing, every evil, every terrible thing was done away with, and newness was found. That's beautiful. Who doesn't want a fresh start? And so, behold, new things have come. Now, all these things are from God. That makes sense, right? We can't make ourselves. This is God making this new. All these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. And then I'll go ahead and read the rest of it, but we'll come back to it. Namely, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. And then it goes on to say, be reconciled. It's important to know what reconcile means. Because if we don't, we miss that entire section. That God is in the business of reconciliation so that we can also be reconcilers. Reconciled to be a reconciler. Kind of a play on words a little bit in our tongue, but what does that mean? And so the Greek understanding, because it's important to go back and say, when Paul wrote this, the people that were listening to him, what were they thinking? When they read this for the first time a couple thousand years ago, when Paul says this about God, about this old stuff is gone, you get a new start. And you get a new start because God has reconciled you in Christ Jesus. What in the world were they thinking? They would have heard this, that a reconciliation means that any change in a relationship between individuals or between a group of people, any change in that relationship if the relationship is broken, that change is being reconciled. It's like taking your checkbook, if anyone actually still does this. I don't know. <laughs> and going through your bills and making sure it reconciles to what you have checks written out for, to make sure it matches. And so when there's something messed up, we go back and we reconcile it to make sure that it fits and so what happens then is with us and what the Greeks would have understood or the Hellenistic Jews, what they would have understood in that time was that reconciliation is making the relationship good again. It's bringing it back into fullness again when that relationship's messed up. That's what reconciliation means. We reconcile. If we have an argument and we <coughs> reconcile, what does it mean? Our differences are pushed aside. We find agreement we're able to come back together. So Paul says that God is in the business of reconciliation. That the old things that have passed away, behold, a new thing has come. These things are from God who reconciled us to himself. Now, that's important. Most of the people that would have heard Paul say this, and I think most people that hear it today, think that it's us that does the reconciling. Guess what? It doesn't work. It's God who does the reconciling. This is one of a million things that separates the God of ours from every other supposed God. Everyone else, every other deity of some kind that people would worship, they have to reconcile themselves with that God or whatever. They have to do something 
in order to make the relationship right. You look back at, you know, even the ancient, uh, you know, Greek mythology and things. It was always trying to make the gods happy by doing things that would reconcile and rebuild relationships. But what Paul says is this is totally different. That God is the one who brings reconciliation. God is the one who is the initiator of reconciling. So when the relationship's broken, when we have relationship challenges, there's always someone that's really good at trying to be the peacemaker, right? Would you agree? In our in relationships, there's always someone. If we're fighting, usually it's one person or the other that's good about saying, I want to reconcile. The argument's not worthwhile. We're not, no one's winning here. Well, what Paul says is the one who does that is God himself. That he initiates the reconciliation with us. And that even though we are crazy sometimes, off on our own, doing our own thing, God pursues us and initiates reconciliation. And he does it through Christ. That's what this passage talks about. That's what is so amazing about it, that he is the one to reconcile. And we get this Greek word, the katalaso, which is being reconciled to the katalage, which is to be a reconciler. And so in Greek, it would have sounded so much different. And so for us, it sounds weird that we are reconciled to be a reconciler. But that's what it says. And so now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and then gave us a ministry of reconciliation. Yesterday at Renew, what we talked about was ministry. Ministry is fulfilling the mission of Christ. Ministry is also figuring out what God is doing and then joining him, which I personally think is my favorite definition of ministry. Ministry comes from Greek words like doulos and diakonos, which simply means a table servant, a waiter, and that's what we're called to be. And so we're called to this ministry of service, and, but one of those ministries is a ministry of reconciliation. He reconciles us. He makes the relationship right again. He mends the relationship for, for, because of what Christ does so that we can have a ministry of reconciliation. And then he continues, verse 19, God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. He has committed to us the word of reconciliation. So what does it mean when God reconciles us through Christ? It means all the old stuff that he talked about in verse 17, all the bad stuff that every one of us has in our past, hopefully, he takes away all of those things. He knocks it out. He doesn't count the trespass against us anymore. One of the ways I've described that to people when they make a commitment to follow Christ, especially in baptism, we get out of Romans 6, this idea of being dead to ourselves and raising up and being new. This idea of God takes this giant eraser and erases every bad thing, every trespass against God. He erases it. That's what verse 19 says. He doesn't count our trespasses against us because he's committed this word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were making an appeal through us, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God. There's so much more there we can talk about. But this idea is we are ambassadors. That's a beautiful picture of the church, by the way, of a Christian, is to be an ambassador for God. That means to represent Him well. If you listen to me pray, often I will pray, God, help me to represent you well. This is being an ambassador for Christ. I want to represent Him well, not just here. I want to represent Him well to my children, to my wife, to the crazy person that checks me out at Walmart. All those things. I want to represent Him well. Does that make sense? So we are called to this ministry as ambassadors. We are called to be reconcilers. So what does that mean? What does it mean to be a reconciler? What do you think? If we're reconciled. Trespasses are no longer counted against us. The 
relationship is mended by God himself because he loves you so much. He doesn't want to continue the argument. He doesn't want to continue the fight. He wants to reconcile, rebuild the relationship. But then he calls you to a ministry of reconciliation yourself. What does it look like? So that's why you, you also, I'll explain that. That's why you don't usually hear me say amen at the end of my own prayers. 
years because I agree with myself. That's what, so I give you that opportunity if you want to. But when we do that, when we become the reconcilers in the church, it looks like Jesus. It's part of our ministry. It's part of what we're called to for one another. It's part of what we're called to at Walmart, or work, the grocery store, to allow people to see that God is the reconciler and not be a stumbling block. Because it's easy to do. So my hope is that tonight, if you haven't allowed God to reconcile you, to end the argument, to end the debate. If you haven't let him do that, let him do it. Let him reconcile because he has already redeemed you. Another good R churchy word. Redeemed is the price paid to set the captives free. That's what redemption means. It's the price paid to set the slaves free. That's what it means. So when we understand being redeemed, like you redeem a coupon, it's the price paid to do that. When we are redeemed, it means the price paid to set the captives free. What was the price paid? Christ. And Christ alone, which is the ministry of reconciliation. So if you haven't made that commitment to follow, my hope is tonight when we're done, you'll talk to me about it. You'll make a commitment to follow. It starts as simple as this. I want to be reconciled with God. I want to end the argument, end the debate. I want him to have his way in my life. It's a great place to start. Because he's already done this work. You just have to accept the gift. So, I'm done for that for tonight. We've got uh, about 15 minutes to give you an opportunity to ask questions about whatever. So far, and we've done this, I don't I think this is just our third or fourth, third time so back since the holidays. I love these nights. Uh, I can't promise I know every qu answer to your questions, but we've had all kinds of interesting ones. Everything from uh, radioactive uh, decay to questions about what God does in us and how he creates our DNA. And uh, that's not a scientific piece, but a faith piece. <coughs> and so, uh, so, what questions can I try to answer? I may not know the answer. I may have to say, that's a great question. Let's talk about it next week. <laughs> so, that means one of two things. I don't have time to explain, or I need to look it up, which is okay, because that's why we have the word to go look at things, right? So, what questions do you have? I'll make stuff up if you don't. Yeah. <laughs> I'll talk about science. I'll bore you to death. It won't be boring if I talk about science. You just have to have the right science teacher. I don't have stuff here. I can blow something up. I got a question. Okay, David. Jesus talked about, uh, or the Word talks about, how that Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. Right. Uh, obviously, future sins as well, since we weren't born yet. And there's a, a lot of people that I've talked to that say, well, a person that did not receive the gift of eternal life, or in the vernacular, a person that ends up in hell, is not because of their sin, because Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. It's because of the fact that that person rejected him. So... I don't see, in, in my mind, I don't see how the, both of those statements can be true. Yeah. Um, it, were you about to say anything else? No. That's, oh, okay. You felt like I said enough. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, those are, that's a great question. And it's a hard question to a certain degree because a lot of times it's, it's difficult to say what is, what is God talking about when it says the sins of the world. You know, there's lots of different ideas on that. And one is that, which is the idea that it's not the sin because Jesus pays for the sin, but it's the rejection, which it goes back to the premise that God gives us free will. And so let me explain that piece real quick just to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, I'm a firm believer that God gives us the choice to, ch to believe in him or not, to love him or not. He doesn't force it. Why? Because forced love is not true love. So he doesn't force us to follow we get to choose. So it always brings up the question of hell, because you, you touched on that briefly. And so a lot of people I talk to, they go, <clears throat> how I can't reconcile in my mind how a loving God can send people to hell. That's an important part of this question, I think, because the end of it still gets to the same place. So 
So, the, so there's lots of very complex answers. I think the simple answer to that is this, that God loves us so much that he gives us free will. And he gives us the ability to choose or not choose him. And because he gives us the ability to not choose him, then he has made a way for you to not choose him. And that hell is the answer to a just God who says, I'm not going to force you to be with me forever. If you don't want to be with me, then I will not force you to be with me. And that's the answer of hell. And so it's kind of the idea of I'm not going to drag you into heaven kicking and screaming. No, I don't want God. I keep telling you, no, no, no. God doesn't do it. He just says, I'm not going to force you. And that's what our free will is. And so what does God do? So he makes a way so that we can be forgiven. He dies for the sins of the world. Yes, he pays the ultimate penalty of all the sins, but I think in the end it comes down to whether or not we accept that sacrifice, whether or not we allow God to reconcile us or not. And so some of it is semantics, I think. And the question is, is it because we just choose not to follow, or is it because the sins really didn't weren't washed away somehow? Uh, and that's the other thing. You know, you go into places like in uh, Acts chapter 2, and Peter says to the people who were the ones that killed Jesus, repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. Uh, it says it right there in Scripture. What does that mean? To have your sins washed away, which I think is part of the answer, which says that there's something along the way that says we accept the gift or we don't. And so, yes, Jesus pays the penalty for the sins, but we get to choose whether or not that blood sacrifice takes away our sins. Does that make sense? Absolutely. So the penalty is paid, but if I don't choose it, then I live out the consequences of sin, which is life apart from him. Does that answer the question, Dan? Absolutely. Yes, sir. Can I expand upon that? Please do. Uh, and and I, I want to see if you agree with this. Okay. I hear I hear a lot of times people they you know like when something really bad happens you know like 9/11 for example right uh, they want to say why would God mm-hmm. you know loving God allow this to happen and my children have asked me this sure you know, and, and my explanation to them is um, it's not God that allows it to happen uh, even these uh, diseases. Or tell them that it's because of free will and what the past generations have done. Unfortunately, we kind of reap the benefits of that. Right? Um, it's not God doing bad things. It's kind of it's people. Yeah. And it never says in the Bible that you will not face you know, bad things. As a matter of fact, it kind of tells you that you will. Yeah, over you, in this world, you will have trials. Over and over. But it says good. that God will be with you. Right. Yeah. So. Actually, I, I mean, I'm with you. I think part of the challenge is, so here's, so let's lay out a scenario. So a bad guy wants to come in here and do something bad to us. If God stops him at the door and doesn't allow him, is he taking away the guy's free will? That's always part of that. Right. It's a debate of how does God work. And so in God, God is so sovereign which means he has complete control, that he allows us to have free will. It's a strange topic, and that's a bigger topic. But the question is, is does he stop the guy or not? And so, Or does he put things in place and allow things to move and be put in place so that uh, he is, so that we are still under protection in that sense? You know? And so that's always a difficulty. But I do agree that the reason there's so much evil in the world is because we have an enemy who is here and wants to destroy us. Before Christmas, leading up to Christmas, we did probably my favorite series I've ever done. And we called it Epic. And the Epic story is this giant story that we're in, which basically starts with, in the beginning before the beginning, God was. God in perfect trinity. That's not three gods. It's God and Father, Son, Holy Spirit was in perfect harmony with himself. God decides to create in order to share his goodness and his love with something else. Because that's how we function. When we have a wonderful, awesome, beautiful, loving thing, we want to share it. And so God creates us in order to share his goodness, to share his beneficence, a good, you know, fancy word, to share his love. But something terrible happens, and that is the 
the angel Lucifer, who was the covering over the throne of God, was the most beautiful creature, has a pride issue and ends up being rejected and ejected from heaven along with the third of the angels. And so the question always is, if you have an enemy that you want to destroy, but you're not powerful enough to destroy the enemy, who do you go after next? You go after the very thing that bears the image of the thing you hate the most, which is mankind. Or you go after the one that hurts. That's why every every movie, like one of my favorite movies that freaks me out, but I love it because the good guy beats the tar out of all the bad guys at the end. I, can I say that? It's Monday night. So, you know, it's the movie Taken. The movie Taken, you know, where they come and steal the guy's daughter. Now, they weren't doing it to get back to him, but, or get at him, and then he goes to capture the, his love, you know, that kind of thing. But we see movies all the time like that where I can't get to the parent, so they kidnap the children to hurt the parent, that kind of thing. That's the story. We, why do we tell those stories? Because we live that story. That is our story. That evil enters the world and has for a time been able to have access to mess up the garden, which is where we live. You know, we, don't, we no longer live in this perfect garden because of sin. And so the devil's here to cause us trouble. But there's a day coming when all things will be made right. But the good news is a hero already came, which is Jesus. And the hero comes to destroy that evil. But we still are living in a, in a time in between with the hero has come, but all things have not been set right yet. And so we're in the in-between time where there's evil that still exists, that hates us. We bear the image of God, who wants to destroy us. This is the answer for evil in the world. And there's great resources I can give you if you, know, you struggle with that. You know, the problem of pain um, is a question that has been asked for, I mean, even before Jesus, for sure, of you know, where is God going to hurt us? Philip Yancey wrote a great book with that title, Where is God When It Hurts? And if you struggle with that question, you should read it. It's fantastic. And how he handles that topic. So, Richard? Well, Father in Heaven is an eternal being. He sees everything. Yeah. You only see a small part. That's right. And there might be a reason that you go through these things. Yeah. Because it makes you strong. Right. Paul would beat three times. Right. Okay. You're so red. <laughs> but the spiritual part of that group, mm-hmm. and we need to quit looking at the physical body right. of the spirit, because God is spirit. We're in a different spirit group. Right. One of the greatest challenges <coughs> of being human is that we see the end of life as a period, where in fact we should see it as a comma, or a cynical, maybe, mm-hmm. you know, if you like the English language, which I don't. So it's too challenging. English is better. Yeah. <laughs> Lots of languages are better. German is better than English to do theology, for sure. But the idea is that when we see that the end of life for us is a semicolon instead of a period, it gives perspective to these momentary troubles that we deal with, which is a biblical concept, that in this life you will have trials. In this life there will be momentary <coughs> pain, but life continues. And when we begin to understand that, it does change our perspective. It's not that it's easy, but it does change it. One of my favorite sayings of all time is that God paints on a canvas larger than our eyes can behold. That's a beautiful statement. Just think about it. You know, right now, we all have a field of vision that is limited by the way that our eyes are designed. I cannot see what's behind me. My eyes are limited, but God paints on a canvas bigger than what my eyes can even comprehend. And so the reality is what I see is what's in front of me, but life and eternity is so much bigger than I can see. That's where trust comes into play and faith comes into play. It says, I choose to believe, even though I may not see. It's important. Yes, sir. I have a friend whose dad died like five years ago, and he went to church every Sunday, was in a youth group, and once that happened, he hasn't been back since. Right. He turned says there's no God, and I've prayed for him, I've tried to help him find Christ again, because he was, and he knows more about the Bible than any other kid I know, like, he can read you off any passage you want, and he says that's what makes him a better atheist, and I'm like, but if you know the Bible that well, how can you be an atheist? He's like, well, God took my father, God wouldn't take your father if he existed, and I, I don't know how to get him to go I've invited him here. I've tried to get him to just 
worship with me or have a little Bible study with me, and I don't know what to do to get him in touch with Christ because he's a good kid. He's got a good heart. But other than that, it's just down you know, and I want to get him back in touch. Right. What would you do? Well, one, uh, two things. One, the challenge is his argument doesn't make sense. And that is, I'm mad at God, but God doesn't exist. And so if he's truly an atheist, the answer is that the result of his dad dying is that we are an accident of inorganic evolution and that his uh, molecules decided to stop being, uh, you know, functioning properly based on the random mutations that brought him there in the first place. And so the, therefore, there's nothing to blame other than the warm pond that he curled out of. I mean, that's what the atheistic view is. So it doesn't, you know, to a certain degree, it doesn't make sense to say, I'm mad at God, but there is no God. And so, you know, it's kind of an either-or thing. It's one, but it's okay to be mad at God. I mean, we see examples in the Bible. People are angry at God. God can take it. He can take it. What now? He's a big guy. He's a big guy. <laughs> but ultimately, the answer, when I, when I have to counsel people that, um, you know, a cataclysmic loss. So that's just a little preview that says you can't have it both ways. I'm angry at God, but God isn't real. And it doesn't make sense. Those two are te- totally separate arguments. So I would ask him, which is it? Is God real and you're just mad at him? Or is he there no God? Because those are two totally things, different things. And you have to know, because until you know the answer to that, it's hard to know what to say. It's like going to the doctor. And the doctor doesn't go, hmm, here's an antibiotic. Good luck. I mean, the doctor, hopefully, that's not what, if you go to a doctor like that, you need to go to a different doctor. Hopefully, a doctor says to you, tell me what the problem is. Where does it hurt? Does this happen? Does this happen? They're asking diagnostic questions so that they can drill down to what the underlying foundational problem is to treat it. Because you don't want, you know, Tylenol to be your treatment for cancer. You want to know what the root cause is. And so you have to ask questions, and that's, that's where it starts, is to say to your friend, is there a God um, that you believe in that's just angry and hateful and evil, or is there no God? Because they're totally two different things. Does that make sense? Yeah. And then talk to me, and we can talk about which direction to go. But if the probably he doesn't really believe there's no God. He probably believes there's a God, but God is evil, or there's something inherently bad because his dad was taken away in his mind. And so ultimately the question is um, how did you come to the conclusion that it was God who took you there and not the devil? Because the reality is is we live in a fallen world where death happens. And so even if his dad was brought back to life today, the end result is still the same. Every one of us dies. Every one of us. We still will die. Someday I will die. You will die. Uh, Assuming that God doesn't decide to bring an end to all of this and Jesus returns, every one of us will die. And so, should he not be uh, brought back? You know, that's always the question. I remember praying for a guy that had pancreatic cancer. 100% death sentence from a medical perspective. And so, I asked, what, how do you want me to pray? You want me to pray that God will heal you? Because I believe that he can, and that he might. But he also might heal you on the other side. And so, but I said, understand that even if God decides to heal you right now, someday you will still die. Everybody does. And so the question is, what's my overall perspective? Am I mad about dying now just because I'm scared about what might happen? Or is it just, you know, whatever? And so that's the reality, is that even if God decided to bring his dad back miraculously right now, his dad's still going to die someday. And so what's the why? It's because we live in a world where sin and death have entered because of the devil. And that's the reality. So the question is, why blame God when really the one we should be blaming for sin and death is the devil. That's the reality. So often God gets a bad rap. He gets blamed for everything. And in fact, he shouldn't be blamed for that. It's the devil. Okay. Here first, and then Brandy, and then we'll probably finish up. Yeah. Is it true that whenever um, you sin, that in God's eyes, all sins are Uh, every sin is a departure from God's will. And so in that sense, um, every sin is equal in the sense that every sin is a departure from what God desires. 
but God does seem to indicate that there are places that are outright terrible sins against our own bodies or other sins, that there are levels. But it, So in a sense, it, it's kind of a both-and answer. In other words, not either or. Either they're all the same or they're different. So in a sense, yes, all sin is a departure from God's will, so sin is sin. But there are certain things that seem to be certain uh, flagged certain ways that are extra terrible and bad, but the reality is the, the answer to all the sin is still the same too. And so, so in a sense, every sin is a departure from God. The answer to sin, which is Jesus dies on the cross, every sin is uh, fixable through the blood of Christ. So in that sense, they're all the same, but there are sins that we do that are worse than others uh, based on what the scripture seems to indicate, especially things we do to our own body. Make sense? Randy, last question. Mine well, is kind of an offshoot of David's question. Okay. Okay. Jesus died for all our sins. I, I, I get that. I believe that. What about the people, though, that, that, you know, we have free will, we choose him? What about the people that never seem to make that choice? The people that don't hear? The people, like, in the past that didn't hear? Yeah. You know. I call those the poppers and clickers. <laughs> like people that had no English language, that live in the bush. Well, even my, my, my ancestors were Native American. So. Right. They didn't hear. Right. So did they, by default, go to hell and why? Yeah. Uh, there are a couple of places in Scripture. This this may be one of those that we could tackle next week in detail <laughs> because it's 806. Here's a short answer, and then we could hit this first thing next week if you want, and I could give a more detailed answer. A couple of places that talk about, for instance, that, uh, that there is no excuse for not knowing God because God has given us a conscience. But he's also given us nature to be able to see. Now, I don't think that in knowing that there's a creator, that's not necessarily a saving knowledge. Uh, because we're told that Jesus is the only way to be saved. But it does seem to indicate that in those circumstances for people that never heard um, of Jesus, and never heard that, that they will be judged based on what they know. Um, but I don't think that's an excuse uh, to... Um, and, and it's certainly not, it, it never is a way to say there's any other way to heaven besides Jesus. He is the only way. It's one of those difficult questions that says, how does that work? And the best idea from some of the passages that we'll talk about next week, just because we don't have time right now, because it's going to take some really deep digging on a couple of different passages in Romans and in a, in a couple of other places that we can unpack and say, what does this mean? The answer ultimately is Jesus is the only way. Jesus is the only way. But it does seem to indicate, I think, that there is, for people that never heard the name of Jesus, that they'll be judged based on what they know. Thank you. So, so we can unpack that first thing next week if you want. I would love. All right. Some of the week after the week. Yeah. The week after the next 12 years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you know so. how to keep us coming back. There you go. For the next 12 years on Monday night. The law. Right. So it's good. Well, we're going to finish up that tonight. Man, you put me to the test. Some big questions tonight. Someone asked me a science question next week. Those are fun too. So it's all good. Um, anyway, so we're, uh, we'll finish up tonight. I just want to pray. I want to tell you a couple things first. I love you. I'm thankful you're here. Um, I love these nights. I hope you keep coming back. I hope you come on Sunday too. It's totally different. Those of you that were here yesterday, tonight is totally different than yesterday, and that's good. This is more off the cuff. We'll see what God is leading us to and you know, and talk through things, and that's good. A um, couple things. One is we have, uh, if you, uh, offering, if you want to give an offering, there's a box down here on the floor. That's part of worship, too, trusting God, even with our finances and our money. And so if you want to give, then there's a box there. It's part of trust. Uh, if you didn't have a chance for communion, you're welcome to do that still. Uh, this Saturday coming up is a work day at the new building. Tuesday night also. Uh, we are drawing very quickly to a close of this project, whether we're ready or not. Uh, drywall right now is tentatively scheduled for February 13th. That's three and a half weeks. Um, we got a lot of work to do. So I need a couple things from you. Pray. And if you have any skill set whatsoever, like you know what a hammer is, and you might have one, then uh, come on Tuesday. That would be awesome. Uh, Tuesday evening, 6 to 9, we do man church over there, which really right now is just 
focus on building the building. And then uh, Saturday will pretty much be an all-day work day. We're going to have to do that for the next three weeks to get ready. And if you, especially if you're an electrician, we need help there. You know, we just happen to have one I don't know about pulling wire and all that. Uh, by law, I can't go in there and pull wire. That would be bad. You know, you actually have to have some knowledge of what you're doing. Uh, although I do, I almost electrocuted myself twice. So that's good news. <laughs> when I was a science guy. You want to hear that story? Real quick, this is a funny story. I'm teaching the difference. I'm in a classroom full of high schoolers. This was a long time ago. And I'm teaching the difference in amps and watts and volts. And I have a little Tesla coil thing that has a safety cap on it. And you can hold it. I don't know if you've ever seen this trick. You hold it in one hand and a fluorescent light bulb in the other. It doesn't hurt, but you light up the fluorescent bulb. It's really cool. And so I'm talking about it, and I'm explaining the difference. And the tip of that thing falls off, drops to the floor, and shatters and has a direct electrical arc to my big toe. And I came off the ground, yelped, instantly sweating. And the first thing out of my mouth, and I don't know why, I said, I almost wet myself. <laughs> and the rest of the day, and this was early in the day, the rest of the day, I, you know how teachers have hallway duty. So I'm standing in the hallway, and they come up and they look at my pants and go, did you really wet yourself? <laughs> All day long, it was great. So, anyway, that's, so that's my extent of electrical knowledge right there. No pulley wire for me. So anyway, but uh, so uh, you know, if you've got some skills there, we need help just to get it done. We really have a lot to do still before the 13th. Our goal is to be in the new building in March. So um, it may not be, it will not be finished. I'm just telling you. We're going to get. Hopefully, the city will go. Okay, you're good to go. And there will still be, you know, unpainted drywall. I am confident <laughs> by the time we have our first service. So that's all good. Uh, I think that fits the DNA of Renew just right. We don't need a prima donna perfect place because the church in the building is us. Right? And so it doesn't matter. So we'll see how it goes. But please pray about it. If you know how to use a hammer, come on over. Okay? Uh, yeah. What now? Are you going to unlock the doors? Yes. So we've got one thing to do before we leave. And then I'm going to go down there and unlock the doors. Um, and, you know, if anyone wants to come down, what we're trying to do is we've got some markers and pins down there. I would love it if you would come down and put your family's names on the boards, write scriptures on the boards, not the drywall. Don't write on the drywall. Uh, there is some drywall. But what my hope is, is that every piece of wood in that building will have a scripture or a name of the family from Renew on it. And the reason is because the Word of God is our foundation of everything we do, and the foundation of the people that God has knit together to be the body in this building. And so that is what my hope is. And so the one wall that is drywall, because we had to, because it's a firewall, every board in there has a scripture on it, a name on it, or the name of Jesus written on every board. I love it. And that's because we're the church, not the building. So, you know, if you want to, that'd be great. I'm not sure how many more opportunities we'll have uh, to collectively go down and write on there. So in a few minutes, I'm going to head down there. And if you want to come, it would be awesome if you came down. And then I'll, I'll come back and finish up here tonight. But, uh, but first, we have a baptism. And so Tammy uh, Rizzola has made a commitment to follow. And uh, all these things we talked about tonight, actually, in Acts chapter 2, where uh, Peter says to the people who killed Jesus, repent which is not just saying I'm sorry. Saying I'm sorry is part of it, but repentance is doing a 180, which is I've been going my own way, and I want to turn around and go God's way. That's what repentance really looks like in a nutshell. Repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins and receive a gift of the Holy Spirit. And then Paul, like in Romans chapter 6, talks about dying with Christ, this idea of going down to water, like being buried, and then coming back in newness of life, reconciled. All things have passed away. All things have been made new. That's this idea. And so I'm excited she wants to do that tonight. And so uh, I'm going to go change, and she's going to go change. If you want to leave, you can. I'm going to pray. Feel free to leave if you like. Uh, but if you would like to stay for that, and then as soon as I get dry, I'm going to head down the building, and we can ride on the boards down there. So probably about 10 minutes before I leave. Uh, but in a couple minutes, we'll go and uh, do that baptism. I'd love for you to say it again. Let me pray, and we'll finish up this part of our night. So again, thanks for being here. Uh, thankful for what God's up to. So, God, we praise your holy name. You are great and awesome. You are the ultimate and final and perfect mover and 
we know you move here, and if you are moving, and that you have moved in lives in this place. And I pray that as we leave this place, we will not be the same. That we will leave here changed because of you. Not because of me or anything that I've said, but because of you. So, Father, we pray that in everything that's been said, your name is glorified. That your name is lifted up. And we praise you for who you are and what you've done. And I thank you for the commitment that Tammy has made. And I pray and hope that we will see thousands more who will come to know you. Because salvation hangs in the balance. In this town and the towns around us. And so, God, we are excited to see your work. Move in us this week. Bring us back together again soon. In Jesus' name. Hey, if, you, uh, uh, if you're going to leave, I've got on this side wall over here a uh, thing that says decisions that define us, which are the, was the message from last week. On the one side, it's kind of clean. It has the 22 or so decisions. And then if you flip it over on the back, it has sort of my sermon notes. It has scriptures and ideas and some commentary of why those make sense. If you want one of those, and then up on the, the uh, welcome table, there's some rounded out questions there that tie in with the message from yesterday, and whether you were here or not, those would help kind of give you focus and ideas of, uh, you know, of the, of the week to keep this in the frame of mind. And so I'm going to go change, and so uh, if you want to stay around, we'll gather over there by the baptistry here in a couple minutes. If you leave, I love you anyway. It's okay. You can, and then uh, I'll be right back.
Yeah, I know it's a uh, 